warmed. Not warmed, warned. <laughs> <clears throat> so, um, uh, and now we're going to move into um, an exam, an opening exam. Uh, the exam, as some of you will know, is a way of examining our lives in the context of God's presence and activity. So um, I thought it might be helpful for us to undertake this uh, examine or recollection in relation to the, the past year and the pandemic uh, to consider gifts that God has given, uh, our openness or our closeness personally to God in and through uh, various experiences through this year, uh, where we've been open to our Lord's leading and where not. And all of this is designed to enable us to grow this practice in our awareness of uh, and partnership with our Lord in this life. Now, the way I've constructed this exam is it's four individuals. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a series of slides that are timed. So uh, and, uh, and it's on a loop, I hope. So uh, for about 10 minutes, it's basically an opportunity for you to consider the exam individually and personally. No need uh, for us to share this with anybody else, but just an opp opportunity for us to uh, recollect and uh, pray with God as we look back. So I'm going to make sure that you're all on mute for this because um, the sound of uh, pipes and all sorts of other things wouldn't be conducive so I will mute you all um, and we will begin
The Lord be with you. 
welcome back and so straight over to martin to kick us off martin would you like me to put up the slides for you um in a moment am I, I can i just uh, I'll, I'll say when i want the first slide it in a moment but so uh hello everybody um first of all i the my time, I think, has got tightened, so I will try and stick within the timetable. Uh, and I'm going to, as you know, as many of you know, I'm not capable of keeping time very well. So I'm I'm setting myself an alarm so I know uh, where I should have got to <clears throat> at a certain point. Um, if I look startled when the alarm goes off, that's because I think I'm, it's time to get out of bed. But um, uh, hopefully I'll be able to stop it bonging uh, quickly. What I'm going to do is to talk, first of all, about what do we understand by pastoral care, uh, because it, it's, it's a, a, an important term which uh, can easily be misunderstood. And then I'm going to look at some aspects <clears throat> drawn from my, in one particular case, from my own experience, of what might help us through uh, this experience that we are going through and as we move towards uh, the uncertainty of the future. So when you Google pastoral care, you get a lot of references to schools, to pastoral care in schools, schools telling you about how good their pastoral care is. And then when you Google <clears throat> pastoral care meaning and get the Wikipedia definition, it tells you that pastoral care is a postmodern approach for an ancient model of emotional, social and spiritual support that can be found in all cultures and traditions. Pastoral care is a contemporary term distinct from traditional pastoral ministry. Pastoral care is non-religious and scientific, to which my response is the theological term which begins with B and ends with KS. It's interesting, of course, that like so many aspects of the practice of the Christian faith, that this too has been co-opted for very good reasons into secular practice. But the problem is that we're in danger then of losing sight of both the breadth and the distinctiveness of what we mean by pastoral care when we speak of it in the church. Pastoral care in the long Christian tradition is both individual and collective. It is both personal and political. So <clears throat> working backwards, let's look at a few uh, definitions from recent literature. Uh, I've got, I think, four or five, and I want us just to kind of get a, a, a flavor of what we might be talking about when we use the phrase pastoral care. So <clears throat> at this point, Mike, uh, the first slide. <clears throat> so this is Kate Litchfield, and some of you uh, will have heard me talk about this book, Tend My Flock. Uh, it's a very good little book for uh, pastors, for clergy and lay pastors uh, to understand issues of the nature of pastoral care uh, particularly individual pastoral care, and, and also to understand what we mean by boundaries, how we keep boundaries, how we grow in our self-care as pastors and our self-awareness. Kate Litchfield uh, was the uh, person responsible for the pastoral care of clergy in the Diocese of Norwich until a few years ago. So here she's saying pastoral care is central to the life of the church and determined by the command to love God with heart and soul and mind and one's neighbor as oneself. So Christians committed to the belief that God loves us all unconditionally seek to reflect the love of God for each human being. That's a good foundational understanding of pastoral care and whilst in her own book it tends to be focused on the individual, in fact you can see that that is both individual and collective. It holds the two together rooted in the command to love God and love our neighbours as ourselves. 
Now, one of the dimensions that we're aware of, and uh, it's not just, a, again, just not, not just a contemporary awareness, but we're aware of in the nature of pastoral care and what it means to be engaged in pastoral care is that it, is, it needs to be authentic. It is about being real. It's about being human which means, as Kate Litchfield points out, it means knowing ourselves, it's being self-aware, it's not engaging in pastoral care in whatever form it takes to, as it were, solve our own problems. Uh, we are all capable of taking our own baggage into other people's situations. So to prevent that, we need to be aware of ourselves, what the issue, what drives us, what's motivating us? Why are we doing this? What are we about? Who are we in this? Are we being authentic? So we see on the next slide, uh, a famous uh, statement from Henri Nouwen uh, about the wounded healer. Um, this is from an old book, 1979, but it's a book that people are familiar with where he's talking here about uh, clergy, but not just about this, not just about clergy, it's clergy and laity. The minister is called to recognize the sufferings, uh, forgive the sexist language here, but it's of its time, uh, sufferings of his time in his own heart and make that recognition the starting point of his service. Whether he tries to enter into a dislocated world related to a convulsive generation or speak to a dying man, his service will not be perceived as authentic unless it comes from the heart, wounded by the suffering about which he speaks. So that underlines this dimension of our own awareness, our woundedness, our brokenness, and indeed our sinfulness and our, ex our experience and knowledge of our forgiveness. Uh, that's at the heart of this process of being authentic pastors. But it's not just, of course, about, as I said at the beginning, about us as individuals, uh, lay or ordained. It is about the whole church. What's the disposition of the church? What's the church in its authenticity and its self-awareness? How is the church herself vulnerable, open, real, honest, authentic. And that's, I think, key again for us to look at. We need to recognize that what we are engaging in, what we are called to be part of, uh, the response that we participate in is driven by, going back to Kate Litchfield, is driven by the command to love and not by our self-preservation. If that's our motivation, if survival, for example, is our motivation, it's not authentic. People see straight through it. <clears throat> so the next slide uh, makes this point. A Christ, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> a Christ bearing <clears throat> church will have to empty itself of all pride, self-seeking, and above all, the fear of death. The churches must be like the young girl who braved the ignominy of bearing an illegitimate child, and I imagine the loss of a society wedding she had been dreaming of during all her maiden days, assured only by the words of an angel that she was in the employ of God. And pastoral care then, moving into the, the next stage. So it's about the individual, it's about self-awareness, it's about the church, but it's also about the world, and so it is political. And if we can move on to the next slide, it's not just, we all know this, it's not just about providing food banks, but it's about addressing the reason that we have food banks at all. So here from uh, Bonnie Miller McClearmore, Pastoral care from a liberation perspective is about breaking silences, urging prophetic action and liberating the oppressed. 
in place of the conventional mo mo modes with which pastoral care has been routinely acquainted with healing, sustaining, guiding and reconciling, four pastoral practices acquire particular importance, resisting, empowering, nurturing and liberating. So that gives us a, a flavor of some contemporary perspectives on pastoral care. But of course, that is rooted in the Christian tradition, rooted in scripture. So I'm gonna head back now into uh, scripture. And, but I want to start by focusing on that first word, pastoral, because of course, what, what that comes from is our understanding of the role of the shepherd. And the shepherd role is key in this. And that, that shepherd role, that understanding of that role, holds together both the individual and the collective, going off to find the one that is lost and leading the flock to green pastures. So on the next slide, here's uh, something from Joseph Allen, uh, again, recent or relatively recent, of all the terms which fall within the scope of ministry, it is shepherd which is the most inclusive. To minister to a community is to shepherd the flock. This is a metaphor used throughout the Old and New Testaments. This is, of course, as we go back in our tradition and back towards scripture, this is about clergy and laity. But there is a uh, always a particular responsibility in this for clergy and we see that in the history and I just want to a little kind of sideline here and I've not got a uh, I've not got a slide for this little sideline here just to refer to a book that had an a huge impact for several centuries on the church's understanding of pastoral care which is Gregory the Great, Pope Gregory's book called The Pastoral Rule or Pastoral Care, depending upon which Latin title you translate into English, which of course gives the complete lie to the, um, the, the, the definition that Wikipedia uh, uses saying that it's a modern term. Uh, the book came uh, to this country with Augustine of Canterbury when he arrived in 597, he had a copy of the book. Uh, Gregory had written it around 590. Uh, Gregory wrote it in response to the fact that he had been uh, called to be the Pope and he was resisting being the Pope. Um, and he then wrote down his reflections on the responsibilities of what it meant to be a leader of a community, a Christian community, a congregation. It's a book that that is uh, uh, suffused. I mean, it's entirely about uh, one's self-awareness and one's awareness of other people and how you engage with that. Um, it's, a, it's a book that's available, you can read it, and I would encourage you to do so if you have a chance. Uh, Alfred the Great translated it into English, and it is the oldest surviving book, the copies in the Bodleian Library, Library it's the oldest surviving book written in English. It had a huge impact. Charlemagne picked it up, huge impact across Europe um, and uh, continued to do for several centuries. Here's a quote from it. The conduct of a prelate, by which he means uh, a, a priest or a bishop, should so far surpass the conduct of the people as the life of a pastor sets him apart from his flock. For one who is so regarded that the people are called his flock must carefully consider how necessary it is for him to maintain a life of rectitude. It is necessary, therefore, that he should be pure in thought, exemplary in conduct, discreet in keeping silence, profitable in speech, in sympathy a near neighbour to everyone, in contemplation, exalted above all others, a humble companion to those who lead good lives, erect in his zeal for righteousness against the vices of sinners. He must not be remiss in his care for the inner life by preoccupation with the external, nor must in his solicitude for what is internal, he fail to give attention to the external. 
So after that little uh, sideline, <clears throat> back into scripture. Now, of course, when we think about the shepherd uh, and the, the role of the shepherd as pastor, we land on uh, passages like uh, John 21, 15. When they'd finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. And we know how that, uh, that continues, that dialogue continues. Let's just go to the next slide. Here's one from 1 Peter that picks up the shepherd theme. Now, as an elder myself and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory to be revealed, I, I exhort, that was my alarm, uh, I exhort the elders among you to attend the flock of God that is in your charge, exercising the oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you do it, not for sordid gain, but eagerly. Do not lord it over those in your charge, but be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will win the crown of glory that never fades away. That again, underlines the responsibility of those who have particular responsibilities within the Christian community. But then we move to Jesus's words, back to Jesus's words and to the next slide, giving us uh, another expansive understanding of pastoral care. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. And if we go to the next slide, we see that political dimension expanded in the mandate that Jesus uh, took for himself in Luke's gospel. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind. Let the oppressed go free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So in the light of all of that, as we reflect on what our understanding of pastoral care may be, what the roots of that are that we find expressed in scripture, what does post-COVID pastoral care look like? The next slide, if I've got, if I, I'm not watching my slides because I'm watching my text. Uh, I hope it's a graph. Is it a graph? Yeah, good. So th this is a, it, 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 it's an interesting graph. It's a standard uh, graph uh, for people who study the impact of trauma and what happens as we move through uh, a period of trauma. So you've got at the beginning of the graph, you've got the impact, so the actual event. So we can you know, locate that in, uh, in, in the um, uh, February, March of last year. Um, and then this, this phase and, and the, the graph reflects people's feelings, so positive and negative feelings. It, it's, it moves quickly up into what uh, is called the heroic phase, which then moves into the honeymoon phase. And this is the time, and, and we can all remember this, this is the time when uh, people were working together, we were pulling together, we were reaching out to care for those in need. Uh, the, the, our healthcare professionals were just uh, engaged it, as they continue to be in the most incredibly sacrificial and determined way. And there was a spirit abroad 
which we I think we can perhaps all remember uh, that was uh, there was something even positive about it. We started talking about oh how the world could be. We started talking about what it was to to value uh, occupations and activities differently, so that we could see what was actually essential to the well-being and flourishing of the human community. There was that sense of, as it says here, the 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 honeymoon, the the heroic and the honeymoon. But of course, as time went on, this moved into greater disillusion, and particularly as the mounting impact of the, the disease, of uh, the impact in terms of illness and of death, a figure that has now reached in this country 127,000. Uh, though that impact and the prolongation of this and the strain on our healthcare services and other care uh, key worker areas, that strain took its toll. And so feelings began to uh, ebb away, positive feelings, that warmth and enthusiasm. And we all know this, we all know the fatigue, we know the exhaustion, we know the toll that this has taken. And then you, as, as hope becomes possible, as, it, as we move to that point where it looks as if we can start looking forward to the future again. And we had a false dawn, you remember just before Christmas, but as now with the uh, vaccination program, we think maybe we can come to a point where we can live with this virus. Then we move into the, the rebuilding phase. And it's that phase that I think uh, we probably can consider ourselves to be in. So let me just say a, a, a few words about this from my own personal experience, it's not the same by any manner of means as the global collective experience of the pandemic, but I, I just felt this might be helpful to reflect on uh, uh, an aspect of my experience when I was uh, a vicar in East London. So the next slide hopefully shows a picture of that. Um, so the, the church in the foreground, Christ Church, was the parish church of uh, the Isle of Dogs, still is the parish church of the Isle of Dogs, uh, and uh, the population uh, of, the, of the parish was mm, about 18,000, I think, when I got there. It was about 25 or 28,000 when I left. And the, when I arrived, uh, it, what, what struck me was that this was a community that had been done to. So it had been done to uh, in the war, uh, the, the whole cent because it was London docks, it had been bombed by the Germans. Uh, it had been done to by the government as they decided that uh, this was an area for uh, uh, reclamation and for uh, rebuilding, but without um, engagement, particularly with the local population. Um, and it had been done to, as the docks, of course, were closed and the, the whole new commercial world developed, uh, been done to then very specifically in the February before I started in the April in 2006. Uh, it, uh, sorry, no, in 1996. I left in 2006. In 1996, it had been done to when the IRA blew up uh, the South Quay um, area and two people were killed. Uh, and that was a bomb right on the uh, northern edge of the parish. Uh, so it was a community that felt done to. It was a little while before I realized that this therefore was a community in grief. It was a, a, a grief that um, was palpable in some ways, and you could see the, the, the range of expressions of response to that grief, anger, hurt, denial, depression, uh, that were coming through in various ways. And the question, of course, is how do you respond to that? 
Uh, and and I think the, the for me the most important insight is that uh, God gives us the way to respond. Um, I I I found myself within a matter of a very few months of being there with a massive challenge that I wasn't expecting, which was that the roof of the building of the church was leaking, and what is more, the floor had started to collapse and sink into the the marshy mire on the edge of the Thames, which meant that I had to embark with a whole load of other people, embark on a program to uh, raise funds and save the building. And I remember distinctly Roy, uh, the church warden, saying to me, and Roy was an old East Ender who had been there all his life, saying to me, you'll never do it. And at that point, I knew I had to do it because what Roy was voicing was the, the ultimate expression of grief and bereavement of his community. And it was engaging in the rebuilding of the building that was actually what God was calling us to at that time, that was in that rebuilding phase as the community managed to move slowly out of the, the, the experience of a, a long protracted and collective trauma. So we understood pastoral care then, although it was never stated as both individual and for the whole community. We spoke about making unlikely friendships and uh, uh, there was a, a kind of implicit process of community building that went on. And although I don't think any of us could spell the word evangelism, let alone say it, the church grew and grew faster than the population because we were intrinsic to and committed to the life of that community and expressing that through our prayer, through our worship and through our practical engagement. So just using that as a kind of little tiny example of of what it means to re start to rebuild, in that case, literally rebuild. What is it that God is calling us to now in uh, this emerging from COVID part com call to pastoral care? Yes, to individuals and a whole host of individuals, uh, including ourselves, and that will be always the case. But also, what is the rebuilding that we are being called to. So let me just turn and end with my last slide. Um, this is from a, a, a crucial, I think, a crucial book written by uh, Pope Francis. Um, it's a little book called Let Us Dream. I don't know if I, uh, I'm holding that up enough for you to see. Um, he wrote it last year uh, and it's his engagement with what does it mean to uh, move through this time and uh, be the church, be Christian as we emerge from this time. So let me, I'm just gonna end with this quote. God asks us to dare to create something new. We cannot return to the false securities of the political and economic systems we had before the crisis. We need economies that give to all access to the fruits of creation, to the basic needs of life, to land, lodging and labour. We need a polit politics that can integrate and dialogue with the poor, the excluded and the vulnerable, that gives people a say in the decisions that impact their lives. We need to slow down, take stock and design better ways of living together on this earth. For a long time, we carried on thinking we could be healthy in a world that was sick, but the crisis has brought home how important it is to work for a healthy world. The world is God's gift to us. And I will stop. Thank you for listening.
Martin, thank you very much. There'll be opportunity for us to reflect on what Martin said presently, uh, maybe ask some questions or um, uh, build on what, what's been said. But I'm going to hand over now to uh, Dean Joe, who's going to look um, at a theme that Martin raised there in particular, uh, which is the theme of grief and bereavement, and also, of course, uh, concretely in relation to those uh, funeral ministry. Uh, Joe, I'm hoping you're somewhere on a screen I can't see. I, I am here, Mike. I'd love right. to be able to screen share as well. So I think you, you shall can... go to the ball. Here we go. Thank you. You're doing it for me. I ask you to be patient with me, people. It's lovely to be here. I'm still, even after 13 months of lockdown and over familiarity with Zoom, I'm still not great at the whole screen sharing thing, but I'm going to do my best. And I'll try not to do a Jackie Weaver on you, I'll chuck you all out. How's that looking? Yeah, now you just need to go to slideshow and start yeah. from the beginning and you're there. Doing it. How's that look? Yeah, absolutely. Bang on. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, bishops, for giving me a bit of a chance to share with the 70 gathered for this teaching morning. A work stream that I've been given to do by bishops staff meeting and for which I've drawn together a bit of a task force of people in the diocese who have a passion for funeral ministry and are committed to helping resource the diocese, laity and clergy in being able to do that even better. And now, of course, as we know, the most critical time uh, as we hopefully begin to emerge from a uh, lockdown pandemic uh, to help our people in Suffolk uh, both to access the unique gift that the church has, which you don't need me to tell you, is a continuing presence in every town and village through our people, God's living stones, but also our buildings and our churchyards. We continue to have that unique perspective and gift and how we can offer those resources of our time, our love, our hearts, our buildings uh, to people as they come out of lockdown. Uh, three work stream, three aspects of this work stream have emerged, this COVID recovery work stream, one of which is our funeral ministry, how we help people in bereavement and how pastoral care, and I don't wish to sound opportunistic here, but pastoral care is a crucial mission opportunity as well. It's come together in three broad categories, reflecting and relating and resourcing. I think one of the things that the little task force I've drawn together has very much come to realise is that we can't short circuit this. We can't take a shortcut to this. If, 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 as we hope and as seems likely, we are starting to emerge from the pandemic, we need to take time to allow its effects to sink in and for people to express them. Uh, some people in our country have just wanted to get back, and that's entirely understandable, to get out, to see friends, to hug people, to get to the pub, to go out to a restaurant, to have an excuse to dress up and not just wear your pyjamas on Zoom all the time. And that's all entirely understandable. But there will have been long term uh, impacts uh, about the lockdown. And they're not just directly associated with if we have known someone who's died. We know that the figures in Suffolk haven't been uh, as big as many other parts of the country, about 1600. However, there have been those indirect uh, effects of, of the pandemic. Uh, where people have been hospitalised, um, those stories that you will be familiar with, of people who've died alone in hospital without the ability to have a loved one alongside them, um, how the funeral has been constrained and the full expression of, of grieving and funerals haven't been allowed to happen. Added to that, there have been the experiences of isolation and loneliness, the effects on mental health for young and old alike caused by the pandemic. People who are already alone and lonely getting even more so because of being locked down. We all know that already. So that's all of that is about grief. All of that, it needs to be addressed. And as I say, it needs not to be short-circuited. An impact of unexpressed grief would be far worse than grief which can be expressed. The grief of all of those experiences, whether they're of bereavement or the bereavement of the loss of friendships and autonomy 
that's come through the lockdown. So recognising that impact and the impact it has on communities, has had on communities, and which will take weeks and months and years to work through, is where we as parishes have a unique opportunity. So my task force is drawing together resources which we'll be sending out over the next few months, making sure that by November, everybody has a set of resources and is able to contact us uh, to ask for help in any way they can. Why November? You don't need me to tell you. November is the month of grieving. It's the month of all souls, all saints, the month of remembrance. It's the month which seems to be coming together in cathedrals uh, and dioceses around the country when it might be appropriate for parishes to put on a series of events uh, which can be for anybody uh, whereby we reconnect and whereby we have an opportunity to take a central role in villages and towns where we can give an opportunity for that expression of grief and of reflection and remembering uh, to be uh, to be given full expression and what we want to do is to support clergy and laity uh, to support clergy evangelists readers elders church wardens to support you in any way we can so if it's around november what might you do if you're a church in the central village or a town you have a churchyard you might want to have a time when you invite people to join you uh, to join you either in or outside during the daytime or an evening um, to focus around expressing and remembering what we've been through over the past by that stage uh, nearly two years it might be and here's an initiative that suffolk county council are really keen that churches take a lead on this only emerged at a meeting i attended yesterday uh, it might be around planting a tree a tree in your churchyard which can be a focus uh, for, a people, for where people can come to grieve. Lots of people have very small funerals. Uh, there's been an increasing rise in direct funerals, by which I mean funerals where there's simply the coffin, uh, no family, uh, just and a funeral director, and there's no service, no ceremony, no remembering of any sort. Um, it may be if, if you inter ashes in your churchyard that you can start to reach out around that time. We know that lots of people haven't done what they wanted to do during COVID, because they weren't able to gather the numbers of people they wanted to. I don't know whether the parish is going to be overwhelmed with, uh, with requests for memorial services, but it may be that doing that reconnecting work of an event around November uh, is a chance for parishes to start reaching out. In that, you will have an opportunity if you want to, and we don't want to just keep placing burdens of more work on overworked, stressed, and tired clergy, so working in partnership with, with, with church wardens and readers and elders uh, to put on an event uh, looks like a really good opportunity for you to work together. It may be that you'd like to reach out to your funeral directors, to your frontline NHS workers, to those who've kept your corner shop open, the people you know who've done the hard work in your towns and villages throughout the pandemic, people who've run food banks who've dropped around prescription done all of that work that's been so important and valuable and to draw them in and invite them to join you so that however you want to do it there's a community focused event that gives people that chance to come together and to ask the question who else in our communities is better placed than us to do this work who's better placed than the church to do this work this is a missionary opportunity for us. And I don't want to sound, as I say, I don't want to sound opportunistic, but it's also a missionary, uh, it's, it's a mission imperative for us. And I think a chance for us to really uh, take advantage of that. So that reflecting time we're suggesting around November, we'll be sending out resources for you to suggest what you might like to do. The National Church is drawing together some liturgical resources, which it hasn't published yet. And Matthew Salisbury, who is the National uh, liturgical coordinator for that is working on resources simple open inclusive generous resources uh, that parishes can use and we'll be sending those out to you so that's the first work stream helping parishes to reflect we suggest don't short circuit it don't do it too soon and don't roll it in with celebration 
I think celebration, I don't think we want to start even thinking about celebrating and Thanksgiving uh, until next year. Next year, of course, with the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, uh, the cathedral will be uh, redoing its uh, postponed uh, millennium events. So let's, let's wait till next year. Let's wait till next year. Let's give the end of this year the time it is needed to reflect together. Next work stream is about relating and the chance that we have to renew the ways in which as uh, parishes we relate to people. Um, one of the interesting things that we've noticed, which is a new thing that's arising and which we really welcome, is that there are licensed ministries of laity uh, that feel a call increasingly to offer for funeral ministry. Now we know that there's a, an aspect of reader training uh, that is about being uh, licensed to do funerals, but it's not there yet for elders or evangelists. And my little work, my little workforce uh, starting to think about the fact that if you're an elder or an evangelist and you are finding that you feel called to this ministry of funerals, it might well be appropriate that there's a more module that we put together uh, that trains you so you can be licensed and crucially ongoing, supported and supervised in funeral ministry. I'll give you an example. Uh, one of our rural chaplains, Graham Miles, has been working hard uh, with uh, lots of uh, farming communities. And when someone's died, he's being asked to take funerals. Now he's saying, I'm not trained. So that was a, one example. And there are many other examples of people who have a really great ministry around bereavement in parishes and might get asked to support the ministry of clergy and readers in doing funerals. So putting together a module for you uh, is one of our priorities. Some of our curates through IME2 are overwhelmed with lots and lots of funeral opportunities, but not all of our curates do have opportunities to take funerals, particularly through the AOP scheme. But there are lots of parishes which are doing lots of funerals, Ipswich, Haverhill, a North Bury team. So what we'd like to do is to help curates, particularly on the AOP scheme, to build experience by seeing what funeral ministry looks like conducted by others than their own incumbents. So we're going to try and put together a scheme whereby busy clergy conducting lots of funerals get someone to come and accompany them uh, and gain experience and build up their own portfolio of, of experience. And that also eventually could be about parishes whereby, uh, I don't know what, how many funerals Max Drinkwater is doing in Haverhill every week. I think it's about four or five a week. And I think having, having help while still keeping the pastoral care uh, with his own parish uh, might be something that's valued. Uh, having a Zoom not too long ago with funeral directors and keeping on doing that is another aspect of my, my work stream. Um, funeral directors are immensely appreciative of the support they get from parishes. Uh, they're immensely appreciative of hardworking clergy and the way in which clergy give so much of their time and their ministry. Um, but when you go into a funeral directors, if you're a bereaved family, to arrange the funeral, it may well be that the funeral planner who's on the front desk who you meet may not necessarily be as knowledgeable about what the church can offer as they once were because they don't have experience of church themselves. So some of these funeral directors who I was meeting with were saying, our funeral planners need training. They need help to understand just what's involved. So here's an example. If a family don't have a connection with church, they're not themselves churchgoers, and the person who's died wasn't a churchgoer, they may automatically think that there's no way in which they can access a church funeral of any sort. Making friends with our funeral directors, which I know loads of you clergy are already doing. You're way ahead of me on this already, I know you are. But making sure that maybe, uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be the clergy, or it could be the curate, could be the church wardens, popping in and providing opportunities uh, to help our funeral directors know what's available. To say the things that you and I know are already am amply true. You do not need to have been a churchgoer to have a church funeral. Someone will work with you to put the service together. And crucially, what do we have to offer? That lay celebrants, and I don't sound antagonistic towards lay celebrants, but what do we offer that lay celebrants don't necessarily offer? We offer ongoing care. Uh, we offer opportunities throughout the church's year, all souls, to come and remember the one you've done who's died. Uh, we often have churchyards where ashes can be interred. 
So we offer that ongoing relationship of pastoral care that a secular Sullivan won't offer. We have that. So saying to those young funeral planners, you know, we've got a whole raft of stuff we can offer and we want to be there to help you. Also, we have a church where you don't have a 20 minute time slot that you'll have a crematorium. We also have a much larger building generally. So particularly when tragically young people die, you'll ha often have enormous funerals where they'll be standing piled up outside the crematorium to say in the church, we have the space, we have the time, we have the flexibility, we have the skills. You and I all know that already, but our funeral directors, it's about building the relationship and about building, uh, making aware to them the inclus inclusive approach that we offer to funeral ministry. And the third and final aspect to our work stream is how we resource. This is a difficult one that we are wrestling with. Um, I asked the question of rural deans, might it be possible? Because one of the frequent complaints of funeral directors is, listen, I've got a family sitting in front of me. They want to know what day that funeral is going to happen and they want to know it now before they leave the office. Or if that meeting's happened over Zoom, they want to know now so they can start telling their families and friends. And, and me saying, parish clergy are extremely busy people and they can't just drop everything. So how can we make it possible for there to be a central phone number somewhere where someone can answer the phone and say, we'll take that funeral. And someone will get back to you within 24 hours to tell you who and contact the family and start setting it up. Um, at the moment, it's, it's proving very difficult. Um, and I think clergy, put it this way, remain to be convinced uh, that there's a possibility of a, a central phone number in the deanery or in the diocese. But the challenge remains, how, how do we make ourselves as available as possible without overburdening clergy whose diaries are already overstuffed and overfilled? I, I know that to be the case. So I haven't solved that one, and I don't quite know what the answer looks like at the moment. And it, I think, involves me having ongoing conversations with the diocese and secretary just to say, is there something we can do here? So that one is still very much work in progress. Um, we are going to be sending out a series of easily accessible resources, uh, resources around November, community, liturgical events about remembering, uh, but also resources uh, through the diocesan website uh, and other resources for families uh, and for parishes, liturgical materials and, and all sorts of things. Um, there's a brilliant thing I'm sure you've already heard of called Compassionate Communities, which is being spearheaded by our hospices in the county, uh, which are ways of helping people relate to each other, not just when someone dies, but when someone is being cared for perhaps at home and is terminally ill, uh, chances to talk around grief and bereavement through death cafes and working out where they are in each community, might that be something that a parish church would like to set up. Um, and our hospices are really eager to talk with and work with parishes uh, through the Compassionate Communities Project. And I'd really like us to be able to take up that offer. And we're going to continue online forums, both with funeral directors, to keep building up those really good relations with funeral directors, but also for those who have a funeral ministry, uh, ordained or lay, uh, and, and people like yourselves on the front line in parishes, uh, maybe to come together, share experience and, and talk and just talk about how it's going. So moving forward, the Funeral Ministry Task Force already formed, drawing together those resources from which we want your input and, put and feedback. We'd like to know, are you planning events around November? What do they look like? What creative ideas are you having? Let us know so that we can share those ideas around the diocese. Uh, and implementing improved relationships uh, with funeral directors that I've talked about and those creative responses to people uh, so that they can really access uh, ministry and just do a kind of regular annual review uh, about how it's going and get feedback from you. We've been here for over a thousand years in Suffolk. Uh, we'll be here for another thousand years. Uh, funeral bereavement care ministry is one of the key ways in which we provide that loving presence to our parishes. It's something that we do really well in the midst of being incredibly busy and it's part of my task force job to make sure that we uh, resource you to keep doing that ministry really well and do it even better.
Joe, thank you very much. <clears throat> Great. So, um, an opportunity now for um, comments and uh, reflections and questions further to what Joe said and indeed what Bishop Martin has said. Um, I can't see all of you on my screen, so if you want to speak, um, could you click on the participants tab at the bottom and to the right you'll see um, the opportunity to raise your hand if you wish to Oops, so um, if you'd like to uh, make a comment or or ask a question, you're very welcome. So, and you also need to unmute when you do. Any comments? Yeah, Peter or Liz. Hello there. Um, I just wanted to ask um, Dean Joe. Have you thought, I know there's Holy Trinity Brompton, I've got a bereavement course, which follows on to try and help families and things through this. Is this, because beyond the funerals, beyond the, the initial time of care, there's obviously going to come a point where they move on in their bereavement journey. And this kind of course could be something that may be helpful. Do you know about it? Is it a good thing? I do know about it. It is a good thing. Um, working in partnership with compassionate communities, this is something they really want to be able to do, uh, both to have a, a bereavement uh, courses available, but also to have ongoing opportunities. Uh, something we did in my last parish when I was vicar of Fulham, uh, was we had a group that's a slightly clunky name, Learning to Live Different. Uh, and that was something set up by one of our lay readers. Uh, her husband died and she got together this group. They met once a month. Uh, they had lunch together and learning to live different was actually about that key thing of, you know, suddenly, quite often, somebody, if they've been bereaved suddenly, has to learn a whole load of new stuff, they didn't before, uh, which maybe their partner, their spouse did. Uh, so so there's, there's groups to be set up, so bereavement courses. And I think that's going to be something we're going to be drawing together with compassionate communities uh, and, and offering that with them. Yes. So, yes, Liz, thank you. And the Holy Trinity Brompton course is an excellent course and one of many. Um, and Liz, do you just want to say about uh, access to that HTB course and how much it is and what it involves, just briefly, for anybody who doesn't isn't aware of it? Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure how much it's involved price-wise and things, but I had been hearing about it through my daughter's church, who are actively involving themselves in this. Um, and it's it struck me as they often do courses in Holy Trinity Brompton very well. Um, and quite structured and helpful. And they, they seem to meet the need, you know, the, the what is it, scratch with itches kind of thing. They seem to meet the need of what's going on in a community. Um, and it just struck me that possibly this is something we should think about doing going into the autumn because people will be moving from that period of, you know, if we get through June, et cetera, suddenly you start to engage with what's really been happening in all sorts of levels. Yeah, Mary, Mary Sakanovich, who's one of my task force, has just told me that St. Augustine's Ipswich, she thinks is running that course as well. Yeah, yeah, great, great. I think, Carol, you've got your hand up, yeah. Um, it's 20 pounds, um, and they do ask you to purchase one of the books, which is only, I think, about 22 uh, pounds. But Atalos um, also do a course, which is Bereavement Friendly Church. Um, I attended that yesterday and I found it was very useful, um, lots of ideas of how to make the churches more friendly and open to people that have recently suffered grief. Carol, do you want to put that in the chat so that people can get the spelling of it and then look it up? Is that possible? Um, I'll have a go. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you. Um, Helen, you've got your hand up. Yeah, this is, it's not church related, but I've signed up, because this is something I, I feel quite called towards, signed up for a workshop, brief workshop with crews yes. next month. Yep. And uh, just, I haven't done it yet, but I just think that's something we, worthwhile looking into as well. We've got a lot of crews, trained cruise bereavement counsellors uh, in the diocese, which is fantastic. A chance also to mention that Rosedale Funeral Home have really been proactive with me. They've got uh, branches in Attleborough, Beckles, Bungay, Dis. Aylesworth and Halston, and they have reached out to me and they run courses and they've got very good stuff, uh, videos for children resources, which are very good. Um, so Rosedale offer free courses for people 
So I think we would want a relationship with someone like them putting together our module training in funeral ministry for, for a licensed laity. Yeah. Great. Uh, Dan and then Sandra. And Elka had her hand up as well. Oh, and then El Elka. So Dan, Sandra and Elka. Dan. Hi, just a thought about um, a presenting issue that's coming through um, quite a lot about um, COVID deaths in hospital. And it's the comment that we hear very often about, oh, they died alone. Um, the grim reality is actually that if somebody died in hospital before COVID, they probably did actually die alone. Um, that comment about, oh, they died alone is not, I think, about the person who has died or the process of that dying. Because in COVID, um, dying people are better, far better, infinitely better attended and cared for than previously. Yeah. Um, so it's it's uh, it's a fairly sharp end kind of issue that that bereaved people are presenting. Yeah. Not something that we can actually say to them and say, well, actually, if he died normally, so you you know you did better off dying under COVID. We can't actually say that. But if mm. we are aware of it, yeah. then we can say with conf confidence, real confidence, that a bereaved family can be assured that their loved one died with somebody, somebody was with them, who was showing them extraordinary care and yeah. love. Yeah. And I think that's a really positive thing that we can say it's a really important thing to say um, in, 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 in the way that grief at the moment is being expressed. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Dan. I'm grateful for that. Um, and you're right, of course. And when I was, uh, before I was ordained, I was uh, a nursing auxiliary uh, in a very old fashioned ward in London. And the, the ward sister was wonderful. And she said, No one will die alone on my ward. And she, if someone was dying, she'd make sure that a, a nurse was sitting with them. But of course, that the NHS is so stretched and so under resourced and so pre-COVID. I think one of the experiences I had, uh, I don't get to do funerals much, but during lockdown I did. I was doing funerals in, in, in Haverhill and for Great Barton. Uh, and one of the experiences I had was, a, was of a woman whose husband was dying of COVID and she couldn't get to the hospital to see him. She wasn't allowed onto the ward. And the only way she could see him was on a mobile held by a nurse. And one of the things I tried to say to her was, I, I know it was beyond awful for you, but there was a nurse with him, loving him, but I know it wasn't you, mm. and, and, and I can't make that better. It, it was awful. It was awful. And she went to the hospital every day trying to get in, and they just couldn't let her onto the ward because they weren't allowed to. Mm. So, yeah, it's naming that and not denying it. But you are absolutely right that, that quite often it, when people were being nursed in COVID, they were having extra special care. Yes, you're right. Yeah. Um, Sandra. It's only just a very short point. Um, I found that because I, as a reader, I have done quite a lot of funerals within our village. And I find joining various clubs, I know it sounds silly, like carpet bowls. And if you're someone they know as a Christian and who person, someone who does funerals, they will come to you first before they go to the funeral director, which oh, yeah. is much easier. Because by the time you've got the funeral director coming to you, it's all planned out. And they've got the hymn and they've got the reading. You think, I've had time to discuss this. And it's just a very simple thing. And a lot of people in our village now know that my husband and I, my husband is a, um, a, a non stipendary priest, obviously both now retired, but we still do that sort of thing. People will come to us, knock on the door and say, oh, so-and-so's just like, can you do the funeral? Which is a lovely way of doing it. So it's yes. really getting to know your community, I think. And that's when the church's unique gift, Sandra, is absolutely being shown. My concern sometimes is that, and I've heard this anecdotally, I, I don't want to bash funeral directors, but sometimes I've heard anecdotally that a, a vicar will find that a funeral's happening and, some, and somebody else will take it and they haven't been told. And so it's that kind of thing of getting into the funeral directors and saying, mm. uh, please ask the question. And even if there's no, if someone comes in and says, it's going to be an enormous funeral, because there's no, res there's no restriction on numbers now, which is great. Um, if they say it's going to be an enormous funeral, we worry, is the chapel big enough? Say, well, you could have the church. Oh, we wasn't, he wasn't a church goer. Doesn't matter. We weren't sure what we believed. Doesn't matter. You know, the vicar's lovely, and they'll act, or the reader's lovely, and they'll absolutely do whatever they can. 
So it's giving the funeral directors that confidence to be able to say, you know, oh. Well, sometimes okay. people, the op opposite is, I had did a funeral once in a different parish from us, when the vicar was away, was away. And I went to see the family. Well, we don't believe, but we want the funeral in the church, <laughs> which Brilliant. is a real challenge. But Brilliant. We do it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Great, yeah. Uh, Elka and then Dave, and then we better draw stumps and have a coffee. So Elka first. Um, yes, there was a couple of points. The first one, when I first heard the person talking about the, uh, the NHS, what I found with a lot, of, I've done a, a lot of funerals in the last uh, year, um, and uh, is that the family have to share, if they are allowed to visit, the family have had to share which person in the family have been allowed to visit. And that has caused quite a bit of, you know, themselves feeling guilty. And yet yeah. they have to th make that, con you know, consideration. Yeah. Um, the yeah. other thing is we have been looking um, in this benefit of how to do one of those services. And we've started to try and plan it. Um, what I'm asking you, Dean, is that you're talking about November. We were thinking about doing something at the end of July. Do you think we should then be leaving all that more to November, more than, I mean, nobody knows yet because we're in the process of putting things together. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I'll, I'll meet again with the others. Um, but if you think it's, I was thinking, would that clash with all souls? But then should we, as you said, November does tend to be, you know, yeah. the month of bereavement. Um, yeah, Elka, I wouldn't dream of being in any way trying to be at all prescriptive about it. It's got to no. be up to you and what feels right for your community. I suppose I've just got this abundance of caution that I just keep wondering to myself, you know, we've, we've had so many false starts, haven't we? Yes. And yes, I just wonder yes. to myself, is, you know, are we going to get an Indian variant coming through? And yeah, I know. It feels like November, by November, everyone's had a couple of jabs and yeah. you may feel, and people will want to come together and be close. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it um, might be also a time to... To, to think as a parish, okay, what would a permanent memorial look like? Now, St Paul's Cathedral are doing, um, they're doing, it's, it sounds wrong if I say it's a pair of doors or an inner lobby, but they're doing something glass on one of their sets of doors where they'll be doing a permanent memorial to COVID. Uh, we haven't made that decision yet at the cathedral, but you might want to be thinking about what would, what would feel like a permanent something. Would it be, and the Suffolk County Council is saying, would every church in our county please plant a, a tree to remember? Yes. Okay. We had been thinking about that as well. Brilliant. And I did say about caution because I said we don't know what's going to happen on the 21st. Exactly. So exactly. that's why nobody knows about it yet because we're yeah. a few of us are just working on it. Um, so I think that and regarding what you said about getting in with the funeral directors, um, I have I always all my all the funeral directors and, and they can see it on websites and everything I have two numbers so I have my landline and my mobile and mm. they can contact me on either yeah but also I've been having people phone me directly yeah and, a, and and some of them have changed from going to the crematorium to coming to one of the parish churches brilliant and, and, and I think it is this it, I keep saying to everybody it doesn't matter if you're not a church goer Brilliant. because that's what's been they've gone in and they've said but I'm not a church girl oh then we'll give you this and we'll do it this way and, and it's what you said we yeah. need to to go in and visit the the funeral directors and just say we are available yeah okay Thank you, Absolutely. Um, last last comment for now there's a chance for more comments later on um Dave um and then we'll have a break yes uh, just just like to say that I actually work for Rosedale Funeral Home, so I have a fair idea. <laughs> yes, um, fair idea what actually goes on in the funeral industry. Uh, it was a second career for me because I actually worked 40 years in the rail industry, retired very early because the pension was paid up. And I went to work for Rosedale Funeral Home part time, basically. Um, although recently I might as well have been full time because I've been conducting in the region of four funerals a week, probably more sometimes. It's always very sad at the end of a funeral when you are saying goodbye yourself to the people that you are dealing with because they're in no man's land. So they do need a lot of support, shall we say, for quite a while after the event. 
And obviously we do run our own bereavement support groups, which are very successful at all our branches as well. Right about the end of November, December, Rosedale Funeral Home also organised their own church services. So um, there is plenty of scope and options for us all to be involved, if we would like to, with Rosedale Funeral Home uh, around about Christmas time and, should we say, piggybacking probably some of their church services. That's just food for thought. Thank you. Race Mills resources are superb. I'm going to shut up, but Linda's just pointed out we have Barrow Benefits uh, setting up a support group. Uh, it doesn't need to be clergy led, it could be run by anybody, but it's kind of meeting in a cafe or meeting somewhere uh, once a month to do that ongoing care. Because, Dave, you're quite right. It's when you go home after the funeral and close the door and they're no longer there. And right. to have a chance to meet in someone's home <clears throat> or a cafe or the back of the church once a month, a learning to live different group, it's so easily done. Uh, and can be such a lifeline uh, for people bereaved and isolated in our parish. Dan, is it really, really quick? Because we're now in coffee time. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> go for it then, quick. <laughs> go on, Dan. Yes, really quick. Um, in one of my parishes, we do a remembrance type thing, not in November, but after Easter. Um, in the same yeah. service, a spring festival and remembrance, it's completely counterintuitive it should not work in the normal course of things, but amazingly it does. So it kind of fits with what Dave is saying, um, and, and also Joe, that we don't have to fix ourselves to a particular date or time of year for this. It, 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 it'll work at any time of year really well. Yeah, I completely agree, Dan. I agree. Lovely. Um, we're going to... Draw stumps now for coffee, so 10 minutes, so come back at 11.37, uh, it's now 11.27, and uh, Dean Joe, thank you very much for joining us today, really helpful uh, stuff, great, okay, see you all. Thank you everybody. Where are you? I'm upstairs. I'm going down. Okay. Where are you? I hope you're bad. Yes. Um, no, I've got a 10 minute break now. Oh. 11.37, I've got to be back again. Gosh, I'm so cold though. Oh. I think I got the whole time wrong. I thought it was 10.30 when I tuned in. 
Bishop Lossie was well underway. There was obviously I'd missed a whole section. Can you share the email? I thought it was 10 30 to 12 30. Seems it's 10 to 12 30. 10 to 12 30. Oh, yes. I right. think so. You're telling us now that you can't. Anyway, um, some of it, uh, it's not what I hope to be by any means. Uh, a lot of it I found very interesting. The Bishop Martin, I could hear everything, everything he could hear, but it was very high powered, very, very high powered. But I could hear him, I could follow him. Mm. But Dean Joe is not Dean Joe of Hackney. I don't know where this Dean got. I can't, I can't understand him at all. And then, and not, the, the, not his four. Those are the two speakers, are No, no, there's three. There's Dean Joe, there's, De, there's Bishop Michael, and Bishop Martin. Mm -hmm. Bishop Michael is more or less the chairman of the whole thing, you know, but, uh, as, as I see at the moment. Elka, of course, was on. Did you? Yes. Did you so much? Quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, actually, things. No. She talked about uh, well, look, I don't know what to do now. I'm really my neck neck. I do it's it's a strange for I can get up there now.
Well, welcome back, everybody. Um, <clears throat> we've got a lot of um, blank screens, but um, I'm imagining uh, behind those blank screens are uh, lurking some live human beings who are joining us even as we speak. So let's just um, wait for those screens to fill up a bit more. Um, still a couple of, uh, yeah, quite a few people. Give it a minute more, maybe. <clears throat> okay, so there's uh, some very sophisticated version of coffee being prepared. <clears throat> If you are back, if you could put your screen on just briefly so I can see that you are indeed alive and there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> And if people do need to drop out, um, there is a recording, so uh, don't worry about that. Um, there was indeed a recording. <clears throat> okay, great. Well, I think I should probably um, move on. So I'm gonna share a screen with you again. Um, if I can find it, here we go. Okay, so we're on time, um, a bit-ish, and, and now we move on to some pastoral themes to bear in mind post-lockdown. Um, now this is a, a selection, and I'm sure that in our conversation after this, there may be pastoral themes that you think are relevant that we need to be uh, alert to. But there are five areas I just want to uh, touch on briefly to do with pastoral care our stories, our identity, our calling, our remembering, and our joy. So <clears throat> let's get into these. So first of all, um, our stories. Uh, pastoral care involves paying attention to the stories uh, that people tell themselves and the stories indeed that we tell ourselves. So, um, in fact, some of the stories that we tell ourselves can actually be a matter of life and death. A good example is uh, the Norwegian communities that settled in Greenland a thousand years ago. They lasted for 450 years and then they suddenly vanished. They basically had grown so large that the farms, the animals and the crops couldn't sustain them all and deforestation soil grazed into oblivion and wind and water carrying away topsoil caused them to starve. <clears throat> but here's the kicker. Uh, they starved to death while sitting on top of a massively rich food source, an ocean full at that time of fish. So why did they starve? Because of the story they lived by. And that story was that we Vikings do not eat fish. It simply isn't done. All the archaeological evidence suggests that those Norwegians would rather starve than eat a fish. They had plenty of native Inuit people around who ate fish they could mimic, but they despised the Inuit, calling them scralings or wretches all part of the lethal story that killed them. Now, you may say, well, we live in much more enlightened times than those. Uh, now we are not at the mercy of such stories in that way. But of course, that very remark is part of a story, a story of self-congratulatory progress, the story of the ascent of humanity, the story of intellectual sophistication, the story of how we're no longer so easily fooled. Even so, sometimes we notice the inadequacy of such a story, don't we? Take Paul Kalanithi, 
brilliant young neurosurgeon at Stanford University, who at the age of 36 discovered he had cancer that was eventually to prove terminal. He wrote about it in his 2016 book, When Breath Becomes Air, as you can see here. As he wrestled to understand what he was living through and as he faced his approaching death, he realised the inadequacy of the story that he had been living. A story, for instance, that science provided all the answers and that hypothesising any agency beyond that which was verifiable by scientific means was delusional. Instead, he wrote, science may provide the most useful way to organise empirical reproducible data, but its power to do so is predicated on its inability to grasp the most central aspects of human life. Hope, fear, love, hate, beauty, envy, honour, weakness, striving, suffering, virtue. Kalanithi returned to the practice of his childhood faith with an adult understanding not renouncing science, which he knew had authority in its proper domain, but having revised and changed the story he lived by and that he eventually died by. One of the tricky things about the stories we live by is that often they are hidden from our view and we don't notice them. We just take our way of thinking and acting as normal without noticing or questioning the story that is informing us. Sometimes it takes people who are living quite a different story to make us notice our own story. One of my favorite examples of this is from Lewis Hyde in his book, The Gift, where he mentions a class of Native American Canadian children uh, aged eight or nine or around about that age, who were given a simple task to complete. And the first one who finished it was to put their hand up and tell the teacher. Simple, yes, simple. Except that none of the children put their hand up and told the teacher the answer, even though there were plenty of them able to complete the task. Why? Because if an individual among them had put their hand up, they would no longer be in solidarity with the group of which they were a part and standing out as the winner was, according to their culture, not a source of praiseworthy strength, but of isolating weakness. That example helps show us uh, the individualism and competitiveness of our own Western culture that we don't even notice. It is not that one story, the story of the Native American Canadian children is right and that Western culture is wrong with its story, but we do need to notice the stories of our cultures if we are not to be enslaved by them. So why do I mention all this in relation to pastoral care? Well, because as people of faith, we are saying, I am part of a very particular story involving Jesus, which I believe to be the true story. And that is central for pastoral care because pastoral care involves at its heart the issue, issue of enabling people to see who they are and whose they are that at its heart, one of the issues of pastoral care is enabling people to see who they are and whose they are. And coming out of lockdown, having done differently, lived differently and related differently for over a year, well, that's going to raise some questions about who we are and whose we are, about our identity. And that's worth bearing in mind. A writer, Craig Barnes, uh, an Episcopalian priest, um, took the funeral a little while back of a young mother who died not from COVID, but after a courageous battle with breast cancer. The church was packed at the funeral which he took, 
and from his vicar's stall he could see her parents, her husband and her two small children huddled together in the first pew. He got through the service as best he could with, he says, grief pounding at the door of his heart. But he said it was the third eulogy that battered down the door of his heart when uh, her 11 year old son stood up, came up to the pulpit and on tiptoes pulled a loose leaf piece of paper out of his front pocket and thanked everyone for coming to say goodbye to mummy as she goes to heaven, mentioning things he would miss, such as her being there when he and his sister got home from school, how they used to race upstairs to have tickling competitions in bed before they went to sleep and so on. When the boy finished his eulogy, he tucked the paper back in his pocket and returned to the front pew. And a soloist began to sing, Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. By the time the soloist was done, Craig Barnes said he couldn't speak. So everyone just sat there, giving grief its due. Eventually, he did have to go to the pulpit. <clears throat> he had to dare a word from God to pierce that silence. That was his job. And as he reflected on that moment, he wrote that even when the pathos is as deep as this, it is critical that the one providing pastoral care, the pastor, is thinking with integrity in God-centered manner about this. Reassuring platitudes are quickly ripped away by the grief and silence, but a word from the Lord is different. Craig Barnes knew he was not alone in that pulpit, but that he and those there were caught up in the pastoral care of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And he endeavoured to speak out of that. He suggests the most important thing to remember every day in the ministry of pastoral care is that we are at our very best when we are witnesses of the care of the triune God in the lives of those we serve. Witnesses of the care of the triune God in the lives of those we serve. He says that this means that those we dare to call our people actually belong in life and death to a faithful savior who cares for them in ways that are often unapparent. This was the comfort that was offered at that moment and he suggests it's why people need pastors, pastoral carers to help them to see the sacred subtext of holiness, the story of holiness at work in their lives. Craig Barnes keeping silence for a while at that funeral was exactly right. It is an embodied way of saying right then, I don't know what to say. And that's right. No human words could possibly fill that silence, which appeared to be all that was left after such a tragedy. Only a word from God would do. And he was right to then get in that pulpit and do his job. The church has always been at its best when it takes seriously the pathos of human lives and stands in a broken world as a people of hope who proclaim God is not done or as the apostle paul claimed in his first chapter of the philippians philippians 1 6 the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of jesus christ the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of jesus christ but this gives pastors work to do if these words aren't just to be platitudes, then pastors have to do all they can or we can to nurture our own faith in God's agency in our lives. Otherwise, we aren't witness to the gospel, but merely quotas of a book. 
So maybe the pastor is a bit like a midwife, holding on to those in great pain and able to reassure because we've been here before and we know that this will eventually lead to new life. We don't create that life and we can't make it come any sooner than it will, but we witness that even this can bring us closer to new life in Christ. All of which is to say that as Christians, we are to help people live out of a story, the Christian story that reconfigures our sense of who we are, whose we are and what is going on. As Craig Barnes concludes, uh, this is a critical insight for those offering pastoral care. Our calling is not to explore the complex psychological mazes within our parishioners. We leave that important work to train therapists. Nor is it our calling to place little plasters from the Bible on the gaping wounds people bring us. Our calling is to help them see who they are, which they especially need when they are in trouble. Who they are is the beloved child of God. If story and identity are important themes to keep in mind, another theme to keep in mind in pastoral care that comes into view is a sense of call or vocation or destiny. And that might be prompted for a lot of people by a year of being and living and doing differently. Many have revised their understanding of what they are aiming at and why. It, many in often secular contexts, such as the flight from the city, different ways of working or different work entirely. And as pastors, we should be alert to shifting self-understandings and God's agency in this and ability to be at work in this. For some people, life is just one thing after another, a filling of space, a succession of events. Others may have a story which is about success. I climbed to the top of my pro profession or, or a failure. I never failed, I never realised my potential or some such. And there are lots of different ways of speaking of our aims, our goals and our direction and whether they were realised or not. Uh, but the pandemic has caused plenty to reflect on the adequacy or otherwise of their sense of direction or of calling. Sometimes a specific relationship can be the crisis, the trauma, that makes for a switch in direction. So Sister Helen Pre-Jean, top right there, great campaigner against the death penalty, found that as she accompanied a prisoner called Pat and helped him face death in the electric chair, she discovered why she was here in a different way. This is when the mission began, she wrote. Or well, sometimes that change in direction can be a split second, as when Matt Croucher threw his body on a grenade in Afghanistan so as to save the lives of his colleagues, an act that showed and embraced who he was, and surely his friends recognised him in that act. Or, going back a little bit of time in history, Etty Hilson, as the Nazis closed in, she recounts her growing awareness that her life was not to be as she expected or planned, but rather she was staring at deportation to Auschwitz. She wrote within this longer quote, instead of living an accidental life, you feel deep down that you have grown mature enough to accept your destiny, mature enough to take your destiny upon yourself. From a Christian perspective, it might sound a bit self-important to suggest our lives are about discovering a sense of destiny, but in, ma in a manner of speaking, it is a destiny to make our way to a destination, which is life with God and with one another in God. 
not as dramatic perhaps as Etty Hilson, but nevertheless. And we might expect there has been some revision of a sense of destiny in those whom we pastor, and so be alert to the conversation and the possibilities. And this is not a ruse to gain some institutional traction for more priests or readers or elders or whatever, though of course that would be very welcome, but it is rather about the summons and the invitation of the God of love, a summons which often is more visible at times of strain and change that can look like a cross or a crown and much in between, but always, if of God, involves an expansion of freedom and generosity. A fourth theme, alongside story and identity and vocation, is remembering. That is putting ourselves together differently in the light of the pandemic. Some people are already looking back at the pandemic and lockdown regretfully. If only I had known what it would have been like, I would have done it differently, undertaken some projects, just grown in ways in which now it's just too late to do so. But we need to appreciate that our remembering is not a neutral act, not an objective act, not a belief-free act. That uh, brilliant writer, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, in his autobiography, wrote this really provocative uh, sentence. Life is not what one lived, but what one remembers and how one remembers it in order to recount it. And a Christian would add that what is more, to look back merely regretfully, is toxic to our souls and too neglectful of God's presence and activity. Our remembering is itself an act of faith or faithlessness. Why are there events that particularly come into our hearts and minds? What is God still trying to teach us, to show us, to reveal to us? Through those, those moments, those encounters, those decisions, those relationships, what, it is, what is it that God is telling us we have not grasped in their true significance? Part of the difficulty with remembering is we are impatient. We are impatient to grow spiritually. And so perhaps we need to be mindful of the wisdom of Miles Stanford that he wrote about in a little book called Principles of Spiritual Growth. He says, it seems that most believers have difficulty in realizing and facing up to the inexorable fact that God does not hurry in his development of our Christian life. God is working for and from eternity. So many feel that they are not making progress unless they are swiftly and constantly forging ahead. But Stanford argues that if we were to grow rapidly, we might begin to believe it was due to our own ability and strength. Perhaps God wants us to know that without God, we have no strength. And is it not noticeable that some of the greatest characters from the Bible, be they Moses or Paul or others, waited for years for God's strength to be formed in them before they accomplished great things. Our souls may take a great deal of time to mature. Dallas Willard said, our souls are massive and they grow slowly. To frame it like that, we may receive the patience to trust the process of maturity and growth. Take the example of tomato plants. They double in size in a few months and yield tomatoes, but will yield only for a month or two and then they'll fall away. 
On the other hand, the oak tree grows for 700 years and can live up to a thousand years, can grow 130 feet high and 130 feet wide, and can produce in a lifetime 100 million acorns. Maybe our souls are more like oak trees than tomato plants. And notice with this analogy that growth here is not uniform. For an oak tree, in some months, there's more growth than in the rest of the year put together. Four to six weeks of increase in May, June and July and the rest of the year spent in solidification without which the new green timber would be useless. Rapid growth in certain seasons but solidification as the predominant feature without which our growth spurts would be useless. Pastorally, we might encourage remembrance that is alert to God's presence and activity. Patience that is mindful that our souls are more like oak trees than tomato plants. And trustfulness for God's timing in our lives. Because the truth is, Slow growth can make for eternal strength. One final theme that um, I would mention, perhaps a surprising emphasis you might think post pandemic in terms of pastoral care is joy. Joy may seem a strange subject to explore, uh, but of course, joy is a recurring theme in our scriptures, especially in the upper room discourses, John 14 to 17, through which we've been traveling on Sundays recently. Uh, indeed, further along, the passion narrative of John's gospel places the idea of joy into some of the most difficult passages of Jesus' passion. And the reason in the gospel of John for joy with regard to the cross is easily grasped. The joy is that Christ has overcome the world. The joy is that this relationship with Christ will never be severed. The joy is that we will never be abandoned. The joy is that Christ is preparing a place for us. And the placing of that joy within the midst of Jesus' passion serves to remind us that joy doesn't take away the reality of being in this world caught between death and resurrection. This is a joy that holds simultaneously the sorrow of separation and the hope we have been given in Jesus. Joy is not the same as happiness. Happiness is conditional on circumstance. Joy has the power to rise above and overwhelm circumstance. Why? Because joy is a mode of being which is the result of experiencing and reflecting upon a level of goodness that is unmatched and irreducible in its ability to transform even our darkest hours. Consider the effects of the COVID pandemic on African-American funeral practices in New Orleans during the last year. A funeral in New Orleans is an event with a jazz band leading a horse-drawn hearse and all the attendant pageantry. In New Orleans, a funeral is truly a celebration. The pandemic ended the music, parades and public gatherings. But the African-American community still found ways to celebrate. One of the funeral home directors makes the point that such celebration arises from the painful 400-year experience of life for African-Americans. Out of necessity, they found joy amid its opposite. The joy in these communities has always been experienced in spite of their external situation. The 2020 pandemic was no different. And as so many said goodbye to their patriarchs and matriarchs in their communities, there was joy. If the African-American community couldn't have a band, they had a boom box. If they couldn't have a boom box, then they sang. If singing was banned, then they clapped their hands. 
nothing would stop them celebrating. And I wonder if we aren't being taught something more widely by this about the joy of the gospel. Nothing could take away their joy and nothing can take away ours either. No matter the suffering or the circumstance, we have the joy of knowing and being known by God through Christ. And nothing, not even COVID or the separation of death, changes that fact. That we are not to mirror the moods or the neuroses of this world to the point of losing the distinctive gifts of the gospel. Now, you may say, surely it's somewhat odd that when a central symbol of Christian faith is the agonizing death of Jesus on the cross, our focus is on joy. Well, if our picture of the cross is that of Lovis Corinth and the dreadful and sadistic agony thereof, then indeed joy seems to strike a jarring note. But there are different depictions of crucifixion and the cross. If our picture is that of El Greco's Christ on the cross, then the almost unbearable nature of Good Friday looks a little different. Sister Wendy of blessed memory writes of this picture of El Greco, that uh, coming across it was a transforming moment in her life. When Wendy, who had always found Holy Week and Good Friday almost unbearable, suddenly saw that in fact, here Jesus dies in an ecstasy of joy. Sent by the Father to bring life to the world, he had done so achieved what the father intended. His agony, physically and spiritually and emotionally, may not have been any the less, but Jesus knew the great liberation of having reached an almost impossible goal. All this Sister Wendy saw mystically in this picture, with its moral darkness, reflecting a human system manufacturing such cruelty, but that darkness already beginning to be pierced by the radiance Jesus brings. Jesus dies alone, but in this depiction, already triumphant over death. He doesn't escape death, but he passes through it and out of it. His body spirals upwards like a white flame radiating out as he spreads his arms to share the light with the shadows that are being defeated. El Greco would have us perhaps here meditate on Hebrews 12 too, to look to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and disregarded its shame, taking his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Like an African-American funeral procession in New Orleans, Surrounded by death and pain and frustrations, we march onwards with joy. The cacophony of singing, trumpet blasts and bass drum rolls resound. The spectacle elicits glances of confusion, maybe even disdain from onlookers. Why are they making such a racket? What do they have to be happy about? But this tune isn't a dirge. And this march isn't a funeral. It is a love song for a saviour who is leading the parade toward eternity. We've gone slightly over, but we do have a little bit of time 
uh, for conversation and reflection and further illumination. Bishop Martin, any thoughts or reflections from what you've um, heard earlier on from Joe or from myself or anything else that you want to kick off with before I open it up more widely? Uh, no, I'd rather listen to uh, anything other people want to say. And perhaps if I do the prayer at the end, I'll say a couple of words then. Yeah, great. OK, so I think you know how it is. I mean, we could go into small groups, but then we won't have any time for it to be in plenary. So I think it'd be, it'd be better probably if we just stay together. So you know how it goes. Click on the participants tab and go to the hand and, and click that if you want to speak or, or wave madly or kind of, you know, unmute yourself and shout if you're not on the screen I'm looking at. Um, we'll start with Suena. Who's on mute? I'm not now. Well, I just, I just love the um, that last slide, and there was a big sash across the chap right at the front, which said "extraordinary gentleness." That's all I wanted to say for that moment. Mm. Yeah, it's a brilliant slide, isn't it? Yeah, I was so pleased to come across that. And yeah, you're right. It's not not easily seen that so well spotted. Uh, and we are recording this, so and I can send out the PowerPoint if anybody wants those slides. So you'd be very welcome. Uh, Ernest. Yeah, uh, trying to knowing that we are not trained professionals as uh, therapists. Um, of course, you said helping people to identify who they are in the present situation. I ran into a family, I mean, the story is such that the boy had a very kind of upbringing that is affecting him at the moment because of the COVID situation. He became isolated to his friends and is being affected mentally to the point that his cumulated experience he had when he was young, coupled with the present situation, he tends to take his life. Now, as a church, do we have materials, despite the scripture, that we can um, use to help the family, to um, help the child pull through this trauma? Mm. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'd be really interested, actually, in uh, other, other people's experience of when we've had this situation um, and thoughts on this. One of the sources that we, we you'll be aware, Ernest, that we have a healing and wholeness team in the diocese. So one of the sources that you have there immediately is a healing and wholeness team. And um, Matthew Vernon, the canon pastor, uh, at the cathedral is uh, the uh, effectively the secretary for that. And through Matthew and through other members of the team, resources can be made available depending on, on what it is particularly that you're looking for. Um, so, so that's one immediate source, but also the healing and wholeness team work with other health professionals. There are other uh, agencies involved through particular people who are part of that team. And one of the things that's really important is that wherever possible, if we're dealing with the well-being of people that we are working with others who are engaged with them at the same time and not simply doing this individually or in isolation. And I know from my own experience as a curate, when I was dealing with somebody who was under the Maudsley and had a diagnosis as schizophrenia, how damaging it was for that person for two or three different people coming from different perspectives, not liaising with one another to actually be uh you know endeavoring to assist without coordination um but but it's a really really interesting and provocative question and i'm wondering if uh, there are any uh experiences around the room that would be helpful uh in relation to that to share maybe people could chip in in a moment about that yeah but yeah but that'd be the first place to go Ernest. It's certainly the healing and wholeness team sorry was somebody going to come in there yeah, Mike. Um, yeah, Paul. There is an organ. I can't remember the organisation, but there is an organisation 
uh, because I had a, a situation where um, uh, an older child took their own life and the family was supported by, I, I wish I could remember the organisation now, but they support people who have lost um, particularly close family members due to um, suicide. Um, I'll, try and, um, I'll try and... It's um, survivors um, of, of death by suicide, I think possibly you're thinking of Paul. Yeah, I think that's the one. And there's a branch that is active in Ipswich. It was at St John's Church, I don't know if it still is. Survivors of bereavement mm. by suicide sobs. There's also, a, the branch, there was also a branch in Bury. Yeah, that's the one, Mary, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and while some of these uh, agencies uh, are really important, can be channel of God's grace and God's healing, we shouldn't underestimate, Ernest, either the, the power of being embedded in a loving Christian community. Uh, we are those who understand that uh, our being, the fabric of our being, depends on the quality of our relationships with one another. If we are mediating the person of Christ and the Holy Spirit in those relationships, then that is a critical contribution to the health and the well-being and the flourishing of those in our midst. Thank you. Uh, Paul, you've got your hand up. Yeah, just um, a couple of comments, really. Um, and I've, I've already uh, messaged Joe about this as well. Um, talking about um, being central numbers and uh, you, it, clergy being more accessible to the funeral directors, it, it um, depends on whether or not parishes are able to or willing to, I think, you, um, pay for a mobile phone for the for the vicar, um, you know, a, a work phone. Um, I mean, I so, you know, I use my personal mobile, um, but I don't. The number's not. I don't give the number out widely because, you know, um, I, so that's just a thought. And secondly, just to say that you know, um, in Woodbridge area, I'm, I'm in Melton and Ufford, which is in. You know, to Woodbridge, we've got a really good working relationship with our general directors, um, particularly the kind of local family ones. So you know, these relationships are, are beginning to, well, some of them are very well established, but there. Yeah. And, and I certainly think, yeah, so on the latter point, absolutely right, you know, if, to, to develop these, these uh, relationships of, of trust and mutual respect uh, between professionals is really important, I think, as part of, you know, deepening that collaboration and the possibility, therefore, of, you know, receiving funerals. But the other thing is, yeah, accessibility is an issue. You know, uh, we, we follow the example and the model of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was not actually 24 seven accessible and in ensured that uh, there were particular times when he wasn't accessible in order to be resourced in particular by his relationship with with his father. Um, so um, th there's work to be done so that we can have the appropriate accessibility for funeral directors and others so people are able to access us without that resulting in, you know, a lack of pastoral care towards the carers ourselves. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, Christine, I think, did you have your hand up? Yeah, Christine. Yeah, I was, I was just pondering on coming back on the, su on the suicide question, because it's such a difficult one and wanting to echo what you were saying about um, just being there really as the church is so important um, and it, it, it because it is something that, that I come across in my work, aside from um, what I do with the church. Um, and, and I really notice the difference when there is um, a supportive church alongside people. It, mm. It's not so much about having the resources or, you know, the clever things to say, because that generally doesn't work anyway it's about having people that are there that will listen that will validate that will encourage just let letting people know that they are valued mm. that's all i was going to say yeah and, and again we shouldn't 
we shouldn't underestimate the importance of, of church here. When I was a vicar, there was a, a lady, Angela Lewis, I can use her name now because she's died, but um, a, a dreadful uh, childhood she had to the point at, at one stage, she was about 13 or 14 um, next to a busy road thinking I'm, I'm gonna you know, walk into the road and be run over. And uh, she felt uh, the Lord saying to her, don't, you are loved, Angela, you know, and um, but but that wasn't a voice that just came out of nowhere. She was actually, uh, despite her dysfunctional family, rooted in a Christian community. And that voice came out of relationships within that community that had actually uh, enabled her to understand that this was the nature of the Lord's voice and the Lord's orientation towards her. So a direct uh, effect in, in preventing suicide there. So whatever you do, don't underestimate the contribution that uh, the Christian community can make in the spirit. Other comments or thoughts or questions? can't see everybody so you may have to speak what about um theme any themes arising you think that are particularly pertinent for pastoral carers such as ourselves now that haven't been mentioned uh, Maybe we'll come back to that. I don't know if you're going to address that or something else, Sheila, but you've got your hand up. So over to you. I was just going to say how important it was that um, Dean Joe was talking about um, giving time to experience the grief and then um, having uh, a, a time of remembrance um, because uh, it's it's so easy to... Uh, in your des in one's desperation to, uh, or people's desperation to come out of this lockdown and so on with great joy and a lot of um, enthusiasm for let's have a community celebration, to actually forget um, the grieving that people in the community have been doing, both for, with a sense of loss and isolation of their freedom and their. Um, families and all of that sort of thing, as well as the physical loss of bereavement um, and actual physical death. Um, and it kind of, uh, it, it is easy to push these things that, that are more, shall I say, somber in their thinking under the carpet um, and ignore them rather than face them and then enter into the joy that will be ours or is ours in Christ. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, um, one of the striking uh, features of scripture, if you uh, uh, undertake morning prayer, for instance, is uh, the slabs of lament yeah. and of grief, uh, which are peculiarly out of tune to some extent. Uh, with the uh, kind of emotional resonances of our contemporary culture in that way. Yeah. Chrissy, you've got your hand up. One of the things I'm really interested in this morning is something which has worked really well for many of us over the last year, is it? Plus, is Zoom and being able to take worship to the parishes via that wonderful. Um, um, module. I'm just concerned that we've not talked about those folk who are still not going to want to be going out and the pastoral care that we will need to continue to give to them, albeit by using Zoom or any other type of um, wonderful electronic device that we may have to hand. Mm. And any thoughts, Chrissy, about our ongoing uh, care of those who are otherwise going to be isolated? I mean, I guess an approach that, that certainly myself and Bishop Martin want to sponsor is without killing ourselves. How do we ensure that, you know, we've got a mixed approach still? Because actually, you know, ironically, IT has enabled us to be more inclusive rather than uh, less inclusive in, in some ways over the past year. In a benefice, we're going to continue with them. Um, 
um, two services uh, weekends by, by Zoom uh, on on two Sundays in the month, rather not two services every Sunday, <laughs> and and also we'll continue with our count it prayer Wednesday Fridays by Zoom, um, and we've also got one or two other things going like um, tea at the rectory by Zoom. Would you believe to try and look at some of the more um, well far more pastoral issues that we need to address at the moment yeah. for for the elderly parishioners. Great, great. Um, Morag, and I think Elka, you had your hand up, and then we'd better, we, oh, and then Rufin, and then we will definitely have to stop there. So, Morag. I was just going to say that uh, the hospice would be very much aware of lots of bereavement calls we've been getting, which are really complicated, and it's it's people being affected by COVID, but not directly, but because of lockdown, not having been able to socialise, not being able to do the usual sorts of things we would suggest people to do of meeting with groups and going out and trying trying to trying to see people and their usual support has gone. Right. So there may be some fairly undigested materials that people will need to work through with others as we come out of lockdown. I think very much so, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, Elka and then Rufin. Yes, just very quickly. Um, I've been involved with bereavement in the past but with different age groups as well. Um, and I just want to say that what I was thinking about in the end of July, which I sp spoke to Dean Joe and all of you earlier, was not a celebration, but a, a, a period of bereavement. I say to all of, when I take funerals, that there is this time that is acceptable to grieve. And it's part of that journey. And I think, uh, and that is very important. I think that's what to me has come out of today, but also for us as a church. To be sitting beside people um, which uh, many of us have done for many years but it's just being there and sometimes we have to be in silence to listen and to hear their grief even if they're silent as well mm. what I'm saying. yeah uh, thank you and finally Rufin I just want to say thank you to Bishop Martin and Bishop Mike and Dean I just, uh, if anybody wants to support me I'm a new lead chaplain at West Suffolk Hospital and I am building my team. Yesterday only, I have seen 20 patients. So there is a lot of demand now in the hospital. If anybody from the you, at the moment, we are not opening for the volunteers, but clergy is uh, uh, welcome. And we have a honorary contract for the clergy. So anybody who wish to support the patient in the hospital, most welcome, please do contact me. Thank you, Rufin, and blessings for your work. Um, Bishop Martin. Thank you. Um, it's lovely to have been with you all this morning. Uh, in that last conversation, the, the, the biblical story that came to mind was Jesus with Mary and Martha and talking about Martha being distracted by many things. And I'm just struck that it's quite easy for us as we move into this next stage of uncertainty what's going to happen and how do we engage in what god is calling us to that we we could be overwhelmed by many things that seem to be pressing in on us and the important thing is to is to discern what it is that god is calling us to focus on um so going back to what i was talking about at the beginning uh, i got thrown a falling down building to focus on which became the the the, the center of rebuilding a community. It may be that it is supporting a grieving family, which then uh, moves out into wider community, but it's, it's paying attention to what it is now that God is calling us to be attentive to in our ministry, whether we're lay or ordained, whether we're a chaplain or a parish priest, uh, to what it is that we're, we're being called to as we move uh, through this time, which I would continue to characterize as a, the beginning of a time of rebuilding. Uh, so I just would encourage you not to be distracted by many things, but pay attention to uh, that which in, in, in fact God has placed you in the midst of. Uh, or has placed in front of you or beside you. 
Um, I was also struck, just my second and last po point, <clears throat> there is a question of who pastors the pastors. And uh, of course, we, we do that for each other, but we're not very good at allowing others to pastor us. And I would just encourage us to make sure in human terms that we're in a relationship with someone who is you know, being our, you know, our incumbent or for, for clergy with other clergy who are uh, able to care for us through conversation, prayer, and through attentiveness. And of course, the, uh, the ultimate pastor of all, including of the pastors, is Jesus himself. And uh, as I've been listening today, uh, I, I've been struck, and we've used the term, I use the term, but Mike's used the term, and Joe has, has as well, been struck by uh, seeing Jesus as our shepherd. And of course, the earliest Christ, Christian a depiction in Christian art of Jesus was not the crucifixion, but Jesus the Good Shepherd, and Jesus who uh, shepherded his people from life, uh, from death into eternal life, but also shepherded his people through the traumas and trials and tribulations of the life of the early church. And so I, I kind of hold on to that image and that sense that through all of this, uh, Jesus is shepherding us. Maybe you want to visualize that it, it, it very specifically as Jesus holding our hand and leading us. But I just encourage you to be, be aware of Jesus's uh, shepherding, holding, guiding, leading through this time as individuals, as communities, as the church. So with that in mind, uh, let us pray. The God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Thank you and uh, go well uh, and see you soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.